welcome each one of you on Zoom and YouTube as we enjoy the Bible study, looking into God's Word to build up our faith, to live a life that is pleasing to God. Hallelujah. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we truly want to thank you for your love and goodness and your grace that abounds in our lives. We pray as we look into your word during this Bible study from the book of Ezra. Lord God, we pray that we would be stirred up in our spirits truly to build the house of the Lord as well as to sanctify our lives and to rededicate our lives so that we could be used mightily for your glory. We pray, Lord God, that you would bless this time, bless our listening, and bless my speaking, all for the glory of God. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And God's people shout, Amen and Amen. Well, it was so wonderful to be back from the mission trip to Ahmed Nagar. We really had an anointed time and God's favor was with us. Well, we are looking at the recap of last week's session in part two of Second Chronicles, chapters 10 to 36. And here we see the reigns of the kings of Judah, beginning with the reign of Rehoboam. And we see that this is now the division of the kingdom, the united kingdom that was with Solomon and earlier with David and Saul. Well, now there is a division that takes place and we have the northern and the southern kingdom. The kingdom of Judah is strengthened and then the kingdom of Judah is also weakened in this process, the death of Rehoboam. We see in Second Chronicles also chapter 10, the Rehoboam who really is the one who is troubled and God is not pleased with his reign. Then follows the reign of Abijah and Jeroboam and the death of Abijah in chapter 13. We continue with the reign of Asa and uh, the victory over the Ethiopians, the exhortation of Azariah and the reforms of Asa, the victory over the Syrians and the death of Asa. Well, we come then to the reign of Jehoshaphat in chapter 17 to 20. And this wonderful king, one of the good kings like Asa, Jehoshaphat, Joash, Hezekiah and Josiah. These were five good kings among the 14 kings in the southern kingdom of Judah. We see Jehoshaphat's victory over Moab and Ammon. And this is the time when there is an alliance with Ahab and God is not pleased. Ahab is the king of Israel, the northern kingdom, and he becomes a wicked king uh, together with his wife Jezebel. Well, then we see after that um, the sin and the death of Jehoshaphat. Well, we come to the reign of Jehoram in chapter 21 and we see the warning of Elisha and ultimately the death of Jehoram. Now, we move on to the reign of Ahaziah and Athaliah in chapter 22 and right through chapter 23. And then the reign of Joash, who was a good king in chapter 23. And there's a revival of Jehoiada, the evaluation of Joash, the repair of the temple, and the death of Jehoiada, and the murder of Jehoiada's son, the destruction of Judah by Syria, and finally the death of Joash. We see the reign of Amaziah in chapter 25 and also the victory over Edom after its evaluation and idolatry of Amaziah, the defeat of Judah by Israel, and then the death of Amaziah. We see all the rule of the reigns of these kings, but we 
really learn one thing. When they did what was right in the sight of the Lord, God was pleased. And when they served the Lord wholeheartedly, it is important for us to do what is right, not in our own eyes, like the book of Kings, but do things that are right in the sight of the Lord. That is, in today's day, we are enlightened by the word of God and by the Holy Spirit of God, together with our conscience. But we need to serve the Lord, love the Lord wholeheartedly. When one doesn't uh, serve the Lord wholeheartedly, there is a divided attention and therefore in this distraction we tend to be off focus and uh, we lose sight of the vision God has given us. Well, then we see the reign of Uzziah in chapter 26 and the mistake that he did, the sin offering of Uzziah, he overstepped his ministry. He is the uncle of prophet Isaiah. That is why in Isaiah 6 we hear, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. When Isaiah was dependent on his uncle's wealth and fame and uh, fortune and all these kind of things, we see that uh, he couldn't see the Lord because his uncle was an idol. But when Praise the Lord. We see that idol was no more. Isaiah lifted up his head to God and he could see the Lord in glory in the throne room. Praise be to God. Here we see King Uzziah. He really was a good king in the beginning. He's, he sought the Lord and God directed him and he prospered because he had obeyed the Lord. As long as he obeyed the Lord, he prospered. And he made even engines of war, but he overstepped his ministry in disobedience, not waiting for the prophet priest. And therefore, he uh, tries to bring an offering to the Lord by himself. And that pride is reflected in leprosy, which is symbolic of sin that is struck at his forehead. And we see he stays leprous. Till the very end. Then we see the reign of Jotham and the reign of Ahaz. And finally, uh, we move on to the reign of Hezekiah in chapters 29 to 32. Oh, it's a long list of kings, right? But we see in Hezekiah's time, there's the purification of the temple, the restoration of the temple worship, and there's a celebration of the Passover. Hallelujah. The celebration of the Passover reminds me of when we break bread because in the Passover meal there are four cups that are celebrated and what we celebrate today in the new covenant is the third cup of his great salvation, his redemption. Hallelujah. And so when we break bread with one another we are confronted with the cross, the altar of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen, and his blood, and we are able to get right with God and with a spirit and ministry of reconciliation so that we may partake of the communion, his body, his blood, symbolically in the bread and the wine and partake of his divine nature by faith through those symbols and strengthen our faith in him, hallelujah with a renewal of mind. Therefore, it is important to break bread as often as we can, and it will build up our spiritual immunity. Amen. And so let's continue to renew our, our holy ties with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our Lord and Savior. We see the restoration of temple worship in chapter 29, verses 20 to 36. The celebration of the Passover, the extra feast days, destruction of the idols. Well, praise be to God. We also see the invasion of Assyria and the restoration of Hezekiah. He gets the extension of life of 15 years when he repents before the Lord and the wealth of Hezekiah, then the sin of Hezekiah and finally the death of Hezekiah. We also see the reign of Manasseh in chapter 33 
and the reign of Ammon. We know that Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king and he reigned in Jerusalem 55 years. Manasseh was a wicked king, but yet God had grace and brought him out of captivity. Then we come to the reign of Josiah and this is chapters 34 to 35. We see his evaluation and then the early reforms of Josiah, the repair of the temple, discovery of the law, celebration of the Passover, and then the death of Josiah. It is so important to learn from the Old Testament that it is necessary to get right with God and set our house in order, our life in order, our marriages in order, and even our families in order, the church, the house of God in order, the ministry in order, even our businesses and in our places of work and study. They must all be under divine order. And when there is submission and obedience to the authority that is placed above us, amen, beginning with the Lord Jesus Christ, then definitely we will see the blessings of God. We not only see the sanctification taking place in our lives, but we begin to discover the word of God. There is a new discovery and a new recovery. Hallelujah. And then the breaking of bread in communion. Praise be to God. Then we look at chapter 36 and we see the reign of Jehoaz and then the reign of Jehoiakim and uh, the reign of Jehoiachim. Uh, tongue twisting names, but um, yet we need to go through them. And we see finally the reign of Zedekiah in chapter 36 verses 11 to 21. The evaluation of Zedekiah and then the destruction of Jerusalem. In chapter 36 verse 21 it says to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Shabbats or Sabbaths. For as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill three score and ten years. That is, the 70 years, that was the period of captivity, the 70 years. Numbers mean a lot and um, Hebrew is a language containing pictures and numbers. It's a pictorial language and a numerical language unlike English and Greek and other kinds of languages. Therefore, we see the Hebrew tongue is a rich tongue. Hallelujah. And then finally, in verses 22 and 23 of chapter 36 of Second Chronicles, we see the proclamation by Cyrus to return to Jerusalem. Hallelujah. Now, today we are going to look at the book of Ezra. And we intend to complete the book of Ezra today, but there are two parts to it. Part one is the restoration of the temple and part two is the reformation of the people. Amen. We want to restore the house of God and we want to reform the people of God. We see the first six chapters talk about the restoration and 7 to 10 talk about reformation of the people. Okay, the first return to Jerusalem and then the construction of the temple under the leadership of Zerubbabel, who is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And through the life of Zerubbabel, we see the Messiah coming forth. Amen? Through Solomon and Zerubbabel down the generations. Of David. Hallelujah. When I say that, oh, we know that um, generations that come from both sides, that is Mary and Joseph coming from David. We look at the first return from Babylon back to Jerusalem. It was under the Persian kings and we see that there were nearly 50,000 that returned with a burden to rebuild Jerusalem city that was lying in waste. And we see the authorities that helped in doing this. To be precise, it was 49,897. 
and this is in a span of 22 years at the time of 538 BC to 516 BC. Well, the second part is talking about the reformation of the people and then after the construction of the temple, we see the second return to Jerusalem and the restoration of the people. Now, this second exodus from Persia to Jerusalem is under the leadership of Ezra. It's the second return. But in the short span of one year, there were 1,754 people that came from the exile to help build the city. So there are basically three exoduses that come from the exile. One is under the leadership of Zerubbabel, and then the one under Ezra, and finally one under Nehemiah. In between, there's a period of 60 years where Queen Esther is reigning. Hallelujah. Ezra is the spiritual reformer of the nation of Israel. He is a priest, but also prophetic. And we see the first return of Jerusalem under Zerubbabel. Amen. In chapters 1 and 2. We see the decree of Cyrus. Let's look at this. Chapter 1 verse 1. Now in the first year of Cyrus king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus king of Persia so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing saying, Thus says Cyrus king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth of the Lord, God of heaven has given me and he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah who is among you of all his people. May his God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is God, which is in Jerusalem. And whoever is left in any place where he dwells, let the men of his place help him with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, besides the free will offerings for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. We came from this mission trip to Ahmednagar, and it was so wonderful to see for the wedding of this bishop's daughter that I solemnized. The MLA of NCP came for the wedding, he came only for five minutes, but he was touched by the word of God, the message of marriage. And he also made a sinner's prayer along with the 2,000 people that were there, 200 pastors. Wow, it was amazing on the palace grounds there. And um, it was amazing, really amazing. He's the one who gave the church there some plot of land and for the house of the Lord to be built. So we not only see it in the word of God in uh, centuries and uh, maybe years, years ago, we know that this can happen even today where we can find favor and the Lord would stir up those in authority and they would just release maybe lands and houses and properties all for the use of the glory of God. Amen. So we have to believe that in Jesus name. And then there were gifts from Israel and Cyrus, a very favorable Persian king that favored God's people. Hallelujah. That is why we talk in the past of even President Trump being like a type of Cyrus and even King Jehu. Now, when we look at the leaders uh, in chapter 2 and the people, they are all assembling together. We see the priests, the Levites, the servants, 
the people, the priests, the people who returned, and the gifts the people gave. Whenever people give, there is a sign of a revival. When we have been giving towards our El Shaddai building project, I believe God has seen your sacrificial giving Sunday after Sunday and from time to time. We know that in this sacrifice with whatever we can give in a small amount, it can turn into a snowballing of uh, effect of God's abundant blessings. And I believe very soon we will have the house of the Lord and many things that will be in our favor for the kingdom of God to expand, for the church of Jesus Christ to be established and for his name to be exalted, not only for our very own stream of abundant life international as a family, but also I believe it will be for the body of Christ. So we want to be channels of healing and deliverance and salvation and restoration and blessing, a channel of revival and an awakening and even benevolence to people. Amen. Especially to the poor and the needy and especially also to faithful people, those who have been faithful to us. Amen. Hallelujah. God is going to do it in a very, very big way. So you just tighten your seat belts and get ready for the takeoff. <whistles> Forward upward for the glory of God. Amen. And then when we look at um, chapter 1 and verse 5, what does it say? They were stirred to go up and rebuild the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. We need a stirring up of the Holy Spirit in our hearts, in our lives. We need a stirring up of the hearts of the unbelievers to come to Christ. We need a stirring up of the hearts of those in authority to give us favor so that we can function more effectively for the glory of God with various kinds of resources like in material, manpower, as well as in money. Amen. And God is the provider and he is the protector. Hallelujah. May his shalom increase in each life and each family and each local church and in the stream and the body of Christ. Hallelujah. Chapter 3, the construction of the temple. Now the spiritual preparation of the people is taking place and in chapter 3 verses 1 to 6 and when the seventh month had come and the children of Israel were in the cities the people gathered together as one man to Jerusalem. They gathered together as one man. There is one accord when there is unity in the Spirit and one accord, there is the outpouring of the Spirit. There is a blessing that takes place, like in Acts chapter 2. And Jeshua, the son of Josedak and his brethren, the priest, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and his brethren, arose and built the altar of the God of Israel, to offer burnt offerings on it, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. When you begin, you begin with repentance, coming to the altar. In the new covenant, we see it's the altar of the cross of Christ. Though fear had come upon them because of the people of those countries, they set the altar on its bases and they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord, both the morning and evening burnt offerings. Hallelujah. They also kept the Feast of Tabernacles as it is written and offered the daily burnt offerings in the number required by ordinance for each day. Afterwards, they offered the regular burnt offerings and those for new moons and for all the appointed feasts of the Lord that were consecrated and those of everyone who willingly offered a free will offering to the Lord. 
from the first day of the seventh month. Amen. That's Tishri, what we've just gone through. But they began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord, although the foundation of the temple of the Lord had not been laid. So they began with the altar before the foundation of the temple was laid. Now, in all this passage that we just read, we see that there was morning and evening sacrifice. It looks like we need that morning prayer. We need that evening cell meetings. We need the Feast of Tabernacles. We need to meet in uh, cell churches, home groups, amen, so that everyone would be functioning and no one would be spectator. We need participators. We need producers in our cells so that they would be the future leaders. This is the best place of practice whereby we can practice principles and then finally release the power of God to the people of God. Amen. We also see an offering and um, the giving of people that helps in all this. And we know that there will be a preparation in that unity of the people. Now let's continue with verses 7 to 13. It's the completion of the temple foundation. They also give money to the masons and the carpenters and food, drink and oil to the people of Sidon and Tyre to bring cedar logs from Lebanon to the sea to Joppa according to the permission which they had from Cyrus king of Persia. They had all the permissions in place. Now in the second month of the second year of their coming to the house of God at Jerusalem, Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, Jeshua, the son of Josedak, and the rest of their brethren, the priests and the Levites, and all those who had come out of the captivity to Jerusalem began work and appointed the Levites from 20 years old and above to oversee the work of the house of the Lord. Young people got into the mode of work. Hallelujah. 20 years and above. It's a new generation. And Jeshua with his sons and brothers, uh, Cadmiel with his sons and the sons of Judah, arose as one to oversee those working on the house of God, the sons of Henadad with their sons and their brethren, the Levites. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests stood in their apparel with trumpets, hallelujah, and the Levites, the son of Asaph, with cymbals to praise the Lord according to the ordinance of David, king of Israel. They knew worship, they knew sacrifice, amen, with thanksgiving in their hearts. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord. For he is good, for his mercy endures forever. His love endures forever. Our God is good. His goodness and his love follows us all the days of our lives. Amen. His mercy, his love endures forever toward Israel. Then all the people shouted with a great shout, Hallelujah. Amen. I'm just shouting hallelujah. When they praise the Lord, amen, praising Yah is hallelujah because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. When people receive the Lord, they are receiving the foundation of Christ in their life, the rock of all ages where they will never slip from. Hallelujah, by his grace and his mercy, they will never sink or slip because God is that firm foundation. And when that takes place, when a person repents of their sin and uh, receive Christ as Lord and Savior, there is a rejoicing in heaven amongst the angels when one soul comes to repentance and here is something like this in a pictorial way, in a physical way. The temple of the Lord has this foundation built and there are shouts of great shout and joy and praises unto God. 
but many of the priests and Levites and heads of the fathers' houses, old men who had seen the first temple, wept with a loud voice when the foundation of this temple was laid before their eyes. They saw a kind of a rebuilding of the temple, yet many shouted aloud for joy. So there was weeping and with nostalgia, but there was great joy as well. So that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout, and the sound was heard afar off. This was the situation, the spiritual preparation of the people and the completion of the temple foundation. Now in chapter 4, we see an opposition that arises under Cyrus because there was jealousy that the house of, the, of God was being built. But this opposition, not only under Cyrus, but it turns into the whole area of uh, Ahasuerus and Artaxerxes and then under Darius as well. Uh, these complaints that go on, even we see it today when people are worshipping God, people complain about the noise and whatever, all silly complaints. But um, we know that the Lord is building his church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Well, the present interruption of construction under Darius in verse 24, thus the work of the house of God, which is at Jerusalem, ceased and it was discontinued until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Always the enemy will try to interrupt, but we know that God is totally in control. In chapter 5, the resumption of the temple construction. Then the prophet Haggai or Haggai and Zechariah, the son of Ido, prophets prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. So Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of Josadak, rose up and began to build the house of God, which is in Jerusalem, and the prophets of God were with them, helping them. Hallelujah. So the king, the priest, and the prophets, and the people built together. Hallelujah. There was opposition by Tatanai, and uh, he was the governor of the region. There may be favor from those in authority. There may be opposition from those in authority, even from people and all kinds of enemies. But fear not. We have to have faith and keep pressing on and persevering consistently to the purpose that God has called us to fulfill. Amen. Hallelujah. So continue to build up people even during this pandemic or pandemic time, we were able to build up people through the high-tech medium and um, through telephone, whatever way, but we somehow managed. So thank God for that and made this whole thing be crushed completely so that we would arise to enter into the greatest revival ever and the greatest awakening before the coming of the Lord in the Holy Rapture. So never fear any opposition. And opposition only brings opportunity to go higher to the next level in the name of Jesus. On every level you face a devil. The higher you go, you, you face a bigger devil. But victory is the Lord's. Hallelujah. The war has been won. Jesus, the Son of God, has won the victory on the cross of Calvary by shedding his very own blood. Hallelujah. The foundations of our lives have the blood of Yahushua sprinkled. Hallelujah. He's the rock of all ages. Glory be to God. So the construction continues. And finally we see 
the completion of the temple. In chapter 6, we see the confirmation of the temple construction as they persevered and uh, the completion of the temple in verses 13 to 15. Then Tetanai, governor of the region beyond the river, Shatar, Bosnai, and their companions diligently did according to what King Darius had sent. So the elders of the Jews built and they prospered through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Ido. And they built and finished it. It is important to prophesy over situations. Pray in tongues, proclaim in tongues. Hallelujah. Declare and decree the word of the Lord. Prophesy and say, thus says the Lord. Speak to the powers of darkness for their removal in the name of Jesus. Mountains would be removed and giants would be slain, beheaded in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. And they built and finished it according to the commandment of the God of Israel and according to the commandment of Cyrus the Rice and Arthur Xerxes, king of Persia. Hallelujah. Now the temple was finished on the third day of the month of Idar, which was in the sixth year of the reign of King Darius. So whilst there was opposition, there was also favor from authorities and higher authorities. Hallelujah. Expect great favor of the Lord in your own life, in every area that you are struggling with. The Lord is with you. He's not forsaken you. Hallelujah. He's not left you. God is with you. Just trust him. Move him with your faith, with your trust. Hallelujah. Verses 16 to 18, we see the dedication of the temple. Then the children of Israel, the priest and the Levites and the rest of the descendants of the captivity celebrated the dedication of this house of God with joy. And they offered sacrifices at the dedication of this house of God. 100 bulls, 200 rams, 400 lambs as a sin offering for all Israel, 12 male goats, according to the number of the 12 tribes of Israel. They assigned the priests to their divisions and the Levites to their divisions over the service of God in Jerusalem as it is written in the book of Moses. And then they had the celebration of the Passover from verses 19 to 22. It made them joyful. When we celebrate the feast of the Lord, we know in our day, it's the application of the feast more than the celebration of the feast. When we apply the feast, we are able to rejoice with his great salvation of his death, burial and resurrection in Passover, unleavened bread and first fruits. And then in the feast of Pentecost, being filled afresh with the Holy Spirit and then preparing ourselves for the feast of trumpets. Hallelujah. Amen. Isn't it wonderful to be one with the Lord? atonement meant to be one church and israel with one with the lord hallelujah even these crackers out there seem to be thundering applauses <laughs> hallelujah and then the tabernacles where we enjoy the cell churches and communities coming together in local churches and and glorifying his holy name. Amen. Let's look at that slide. It says there, Ezra and Nehemiah. Okay, these two books, we'll come back to Nehemiah. And this house was finished in chapter 6, verse 15 of Ezra. And this house was finished. What God begins, he finishes doing. Hallelujah. He began on the first day of creation and he ended well on the sixth day and the seventh day he rested with a perfect work, fully satisfied. We also see 
chapter 6 of verse 15 in the book of Nehemiah, just as in Ezra 6.15, we see, so the wall was finished. Amen. The house was finished in Ezra under the leadership of Ezra, the house of God. Well, the wall of Jerusalem was completed. Amen. In 52 days but under the leadership of Nehemiah. What couldn't be completed in 91 years was completed in 52 days. And here we see a beautiful prophetic word for a speed anointing that God is going to do in the same time in this last hour of the final day. In chapter 7, we see Ezra's qualifications, Arthur Xerxes' letter, and Ezra's response. Hallelujah. And then chapter 8, we see the census of the returning Israelites. They are all numbered and all are checked. There's an evaluation there that takes place. Then there is the acquisition of the temple leadership. So everyone is taking their place. There's a proclamation of a fast in verses 21 to 23. Remember, in every building, there is prayer and fast which takes place. Amen. That is a spiritual cleansing and a passion for God. Amen. Reflected in fasting and praying. Hallelujah. A determination, a tenacity that would endure to the very end until the work is completed or finished. Christ Jesus shouted from the cross, the altar, finished. Hallelujah. It is finished. The sacrifice is finished once and for all. And when he ascended, and he sat on the throne, he will shout, it's done, hallelujah. God believes in finishing the work he's begun, hallelujah. So the return is completed in chapter eight, but in chapter seven, verse 10, for Ezra had prepared his heart, hallelujah, to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach statutes and ordinances in Israel. So there's, there are beautiful nuggets found in this verse. So Ezra prepared his heart to seek the word of the Lord. We must prepare our hearts with confession, cleansing, a right spirit, a right attitude, with forgiveness and giving forgiveness so that there are no more blocks when we dive into the Word of God and we will be illuminated. Hallelujah. We not only seek His Word, we go on to do it. Ezra did it and then he taught the word of the Lord to Israel. So each one of us, especially leaders, must prepare their hearts, prepare their hearts, practice the word of God and then preach it and teach it all for the glory of God. Then we see this is a wonderful principle, underline it in your Bible. Ezra chapter 7, verse 10. Uh, we see the restoration of the people in chapters 9 and 10. Here Israel intermarries, verses 1 to 2. There is. The holy seed is mixed with the peoples of the land. This is displeasing to God. It's a trespass. We must be equally yoked together in marriage, even in businesses. And so there's a lamentation of the leader, Ezra. So when I heard this thing in verses 3 and 4, I tore my garment and my robe and plucked out some of the hair of my head and beard 
and sat down astonished. He's astonished at the compromise of the people of Israel, the people of God, intermarrying with unbelievers, with the wicked nations. How could they be deceived? He's also plucking out his hair from his head and from his beard. My, besides tearing his garments. Then everyone who trembled at the words of the God of Israel assembled to me. Now there was a separation because of the transgression of those who had been carried away captive. And I sat astonished until the evening sacrifice. Always when you fall into sin, there is a bondage and the devil has a sway over your life. He begins to reign over your life. Therefore, it is important to repent of sin, forsake it, get out of his clutches and come under the covering of the Lord himself. The Lord's name, the name of Yehoshua is a name which is above every other name. It's like that mighty tower where the righteous run into it and are safe. Amen. We see God's faithfulness in verses 5 to 9. At the evening sacrifice, I arose from my fasting. And having torn my garment and my robe, I fell on my knees and spread out my hands to the Lord my God. It's showing you how to pray. And I said, O oh my God, I am too ashamed and humiliated to lift up my face to you. He's ashamed of the people of God. My God, for our iniquities have risen higher than our heads. Guilt has grown up to the heavens. Since the days of our fathers to this day, we have been very guilty. And for our iniquities, we are our kings and our priests have been delivered into the hand of the kings of the lands, to the sword, to captivity, to plunder and to humiliation as it is this day. And now for a little while grace has been shown. Hallelujah. You saw that in a time of law. There's the character of God being revealed, his grace. Shown from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape. Hallelujah. And to give us a peg in his holy place. We want to be a peg, a tent peg. Hallelujah. In the house of the Lord. Amen. Not a pillar, but at least a peg. That our God may enlighten our eyes and give us a measure of revival in our bondage. For we were slaves, yet our God did not forsake us in our bondage, but he extended mercy to us in the sight of the kings of Persia to revive us, to repair the house of our God, to rebuild its ruins, and to give us a wall in Judah and Jerusalem. Hallelujah. The wall speaks of salvation. And then we see Israel's faithfulness, my Jesus, till the end of the nine. Chapter 10, Israel laments again very bitterly, weeping bitterly. Oh, under Ezra's prayer in verses 1 and 2, and the covenant is instituted in verses 3 to 5. It says, now, therefore, let us make a covenant with our God to put away all these wives and those who have been born to them according to the advice of my master and of those who tremble at the commandment of our God and let it be done according to the law. Verse 4, arise for this matter is your responsibility. Arise for this matter is your responsibility. We need to arise and build because it is our responsibility to build. We also are with you. Be of good courage and do it. 
Hallelujah. See, obedience is the hallmark of the house of God. Then Ezra arose and made the leaders of the priests, the Levites, and all Israel swear an oath that they would do according to this word. So they swore an oath. They had to come, one mind, one heart, one spirit, confessing the same thing. We ought to confess the same vision, the same word, and we will have it done. Then there is a separation which is accepted, hallelujah, hallelujah, from all kinds of compromise, amen. And then there's a separation of priests, okay, in chapter 10, separation of Levites and separation of all the people, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. We love you, Lord. Chapter 10, verse 4. This matter is in your hands. Rise up. We will support you. So take courage and do it. Amen. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word encourages us to be doers of the word and be wise builders that we would build our lives our marriages, our families, the house of the Lord on the solid rock. All the ministry that we do will glorify your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We pray that your temple would be built. The church of Jesus Christ, the bride of Christ, would be completed soon. Hallelujah and the people of God would be sanctified in spirit, soul, and body to be revival ready, rapture ready, and reward ready for the glory of God before the trumpet sounds and the coming of Christ on the clouds will be fulfilled. Yeah.